This is the third part of our uh, talk on the book uh, Theistic Evolution, or the second part, I should say, in the talk in our book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. This part is entitled Three Reasons to Reject Darwin. Now, <clears throat> that's a shortened title. Uh, we've been looking at the book atheistic evolution will continue to do so. Uh, that's what the cover looks like. The, uh, uh, before we go, I want to review what they're actually talking about. Um, there is what you could call young life creation in various flavors. There is what is traditionally known as old earth creation. Um, there is uh, a an atheistic evolution where, yes, God did it, and yes, you can tell, but uh, there weren't any specific creations um, of uh, whole animals rather gradually evolving with help. And then there is what you could call non-ID theistic evolution. That is the idea that evolution happened without noticeable guidance. If you push people in that group, sometimes they'll say, well, God really helped, but you just can't tell. Uh, other people will say, no, he just set it all up and left, let it run. And finally, there is atheistic evolution. And what the book is specifically targeting is that non-ID theistic evolution. That's what's getting the critique. Although they do kind of incidentally critique atheistic evolution at the same time. Um, this first chapter is by Douglas Axe. It's part one, the scientific cri critique of theistic evolution. And it's part one of the, uh, section one of that part, the failure of neo-Darwinism. And this particular title is uh, a bit longer than what I had, but it, I think it reduces to it kind of. Three good reasons for people of faith to reject Darwin's explanation of life. And uh, you, we begin with the summary, which is kind of like an abstract and gives you an idea of where they're going. And actually, this is a particularly good summary. People of faith should reject the call to affirm that Dar the Darwinian explanation of life and should af instead affirm the traditional understanding of divine creative action which defies reduction to natural causes. There are three good reasons for this. Number one, acceptance of Darwinism carries a substantial apologetic cost. Specifically, if Darwin was right that life can be explained by accidental physical causes, then we must forfeit the claim that all humans are confronted by God's existence when we behold the wonders of the living world. If it could have been otherwise, you can't say you really have to give God credit. Number two, all accidental explanations of life, whether Darwinian or not, are demonstrably implausible. And number three, the common justifications for accommodating Darwin's theory within the framework of traditional faith are confused. Confused is a kind word for what he would say. Uh, <clears throat> first things first, you heard the claim that natural selection acting upon random genetic mutations created all life from a primitive life form. In the century and a half since Darwin gave that idea its beginning, few claims have generated more controversy. How should people of faith respond to this controversy? Well, two questions immediately present themselves. Number one, is Darwin's claim correct? And number two, what would be the implications for our faith if it were correct? Now, because many people think the answer to question one requires technical expertise, there's a tendency to answer it by proxy. 
and is choosing to side with experts in either the yes camp or the no camp, and then entrusting the defense of that answer to those experts. As understandable as this is in some respects, I advise against it for several reasons. Number one, there is widespread confusion even as to who the relevant experts are. Non-scientists tend to be so acutely aware of their lack of expertise that they defer to anyone with a science degree, most of whom have no more familiarity with the technical critique of Darwinism than anyone else. Indeed, because even highly accomplished biology professors are accomplished only within their narrow fields of specialization, it takes a certain amount of scientific familiarity just to discern who can really speak to the subject of biological origins from scientific expertise. Keith Fox and I have engaged in friendly debate on that subject, and so I hope he won't mind me using him as an example. As a biochemistry professor at the University of Southampton in the UK, Fox is an established expert on how various molecules bind to DNA. Having done no research on that subject, I'm obviously in no position to critique his work. Likewise, having done no work on protein evolution, he is really in no position to critique my work. And in a professional context, he wouldn't pretend otherwise. However, the origins topic has attracted such a wide following that most debate on the subject occurs at the popular level. And as the associate director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, Fox understandably wants to speak to that debate. He should speak to it. But the listening public would benefit from knowing that he does so as a non-expert. For instance, based on my research, I claim that enzymes, the protein molecules that do life's chemistry, cannot be invented by any accidental evolutionary process. Life as we see it depends on highly proficient enzymes, all built within cells by linking many amino acids, typically hundreds, together in precise sequence. These special sequences enable the long chains of linked amino acids to fold up into complex, function-specific structures. In criticizing my claim that evolution cannot explain the origin of enzymes, Fox has repeated the standard idea that evolution builds gradually from small beginnings. According to him, weak enzyme function can be produced by linking a mere two amino acids together. And this can serve as an evolutionary starting point. From there, natural selection can build the exquisite enzymes we see in life, he thinks. In his words, one doesn't have to start with an unlikely polypeptide, that is amino acid chain, with billion-fold activity, but from, say, a specific dipeptide, of which there are only 400 using the natural amino acids, with a few-fold improvement. There's a serious problem here, though most people need help to see it. Scientists who know about enzymes and the various attempts to use selection to enhance them would never join Fox in this claim. For one good reason, they, can't, they know they can't back it up. Fox was hazarding a wild guess that, for reasons I explained elsewhere, happened to be wildly wrong. Of course, had he openly called it a wild guess, there would be no cause for concern. Well, wrong guesses are harmless, provided we know they're only guesses. But when people of Fox's scientific stature pull scientific claims out of thin air without saying so, people naturally take these claims more seriously than they should. That is a cause for concern. The second problem with seeing question one as an experts only question is that when you stop to realize how much is at stake here, the thought of handling author handing authority over such crucial matters to scientific experts ought to be unsettling. It's also completely unnecessary. I've argued at length that the failure of Darwin's explanation of life is a common sense fact, a plain truth testified to by our strong intuition that life is designed and that by a lifetime of experience that confirms this intuition. Uh, to resolve the tension between what our intuition tells us and what the evolutionary textbooks tell us, then we really should begin by recognizing that we're all fully qualified to participate in the debate over our origin. The third problem with leaving the ex evaluation of Darwin's claim to the experts is that this tempts us to skip straight to question two. The question of how his claim, if true, should impact our faith. No matter how provisionally we make this move, the very fact that we've done so implicitly conveys a yes answer to the question of whether his claim really is true. 
Question one. After all, question two isn't even worth asking unless question one has been answered in the affirmative. In where the conflict really lies, philosopher Alvin Platinga proceeds to question two as carefully as anyone can, I think, and yet not without creating a problem. His first chapter, Evolution and Christian Belief, summarizes his critique of Richard Dawkins' defense of Darwinism in The Blind Watchmaker as follows. Dawkins claims that the living world came to be by way of unguided evolution. What he actually argues, however, is that there is a Darwinian series for contemporary life forms. As we have seen, this argument is inconclusive. But even if it were airtight, it wouldn't show, of course, that the living world, let alone the entire universe, is without design. At best, it would show, given a couple of assumptions, that it is not astronomically improbable that the living world was produced by unguided evolution and hence without design. Notice that from the vantage point of faith, the word best in Platinga's final sentence should read as, be read as worst. That is, Platinga tells us that at worst, Dawkins has shown there's at least a slim chance that we are cosmic accidents. I suppose Platinga's conclusion would sound like good news to anyone who worries that science has killed God, if there are such people. I think there are, but that's a different issue. On the other hand, anyone who takes comfort in the idea that science is the study of God's created order might actually affirm God's existence is apt to be disappointed. If Darkin's argument has actually been thoroughly refuted, then that's the point that needs to be proclaimed. To grant the possibility of our being cosmic accidents only to say this doesn't necessarily mean we are cosmic accidents is to say something much less faith affirming. Again, I have great sympathy for people of faith who feel compelled to answer people like Dawkins, but who, in thinking that Darwini Darwinism sinks or swims on its technical merits, feels ill-equipped to challenge the evolutionary story. The good news here is that the familiar version of science we all participate in, which I call common science, is all we really need to be fully confident that Darwin's theory has already sunk. This brings us to the last problem with avoiding question one, which is that our natural tendency to look for the upside even in difficult circumstances can cause us to neglect the significance of the downside. This is particularly counterproductive in situations where the downside is counterfactual, meaning that the actual circumstances lack the downside. To attribute grand creative power to Darwin's evolutionary mechanism, even provisionally, without acknowledging the accompanying cost, is to make precisely this mistake. The truth is that the existence of a plausible accidental explanation of life would carry a hefty downside for people of faith, even if it isn't the correct explanation. And we're going to explain that in just a bit. In other words, there's just, there's a big cost to acknowledging the mere plausibility of life being accidental, even, this, even if this acknowledgement comes with a firm declaration that life didn't actually come about that way. We will focus next on the apologetic component of this cost, which we can think of as the immediate cost of an affirmative answer to question one before we even consider question two. Other qu chapters in this volume will focus on the downstream costs, and they will. Specifically, the damage to Christian doctrine we uncover when we take a careful look at question two. Although I won't be addressing these downstream costs myself, I should say that I fully recognize the most significant of them to be much more profoundly important than the apologetic cost. Nevertheless, we will see that the apologetic cost itse is itself highly significant. Here's the apologetic cost, the cost of concession. The conviction that accidental explanations of life are so obviously counterfeit that they don't merit serious consideration seems to be a background assumption of scripture. The book of Job, for example, tells us how Job was reminded of his smallness when asked by his creator, is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? Those questions have the same humbling effect on us thousands of years later. Anyone who thinks otherwise, anyone who thinks they have a solid grasp on life, should try designing and making something remotely comparable to a hawk or an eagle. Flying toys with flapping wings don't even come close. These things are made on assembly lines, part by part, only to fall apart with repeated use. 
Life is strikingly different, nurtured at first by nothing more than the yolk inside its shell. The developing eaglet grows to the point where it is ready to break out of that small world and enter the big world. The young bird then spends years mastering all the skills of living life as an eagle before finding a mate and bringing forth the next generation. There is no raptor assembly line. The best medicine for anyone who thinks otherwise is to take up this challenge of trying to do something remotely comparable to what God has done. Once we grasp the impossibility of this, Job's humble awe is the only appropriate response. I've uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. If you agree that this is the right response, then surely you must agree that the idea of hawks and eagles having appeared by accident is all wrong. In other words, if we agree that God's probing hand had his good and proper effect on Job, then we should also agree that Job would have been completely in the wrong to have answered with something like, actually God, hawks and eagles could have appeared without any need for understanding of purposeful action. Despite the obvious wrongness of that response, we have in recent years seen an increasing number of intelligent and earnest people of faith who have declared something very much like it. At least, I see no way around the fact that the arresting awe we're meant to have for the maker of the majestic eagle is lost the moment we accept that accidental physical processes could have done the making instead. I use the words could have in that last sentence for a reason. The Christian thinkers I quote as examples all take refuge in this ambiguity. We should happily concede that God's touch was unnecessary in exchange for the unassailable assurance that it just might have been there anyway. Physicist Stephen Barr, one of the advocates of this view, opened an article titled Chance by Design as follows. Christians who accept Darwinian evolution are, it's sometimes said, trying to have it both ways. If evolution is driven by random mutations, we cannot be a part of a divine plan. How the critics act can ask, can we possibly exist by chance and by design, by accident and by intention? Barr's answer to this question is evident in his subtitle, The Scientific Concept of Randomness is Consistent with Divine Pro Providence. I certainly agree with this, but again, I go back to the dialogue between God and Job. If the aim of that dialogue had merely been to underscore the comprehensive scope of divine providence, then pointing to clouds or craters or the, on the moon would have been just as effective as pointing to the hawk and the eagle. Indeed, it would have been odd to point to any particular thing because this general aspect of God's providence doesn't force us, or doesn't force itself upon us by what we see. To the theist, of course, nothing happens apart from God, but then no theist came to that view by looking at clouds or craters. Such things are not at all inconsistent with God's presence, but neither do they confront us with his presence. Skipping over a paragraph, in discussing this, I'll call, then I'll call the view I aim to defend the confrontational view, the view that God's creation of life clearly and obviously defies explanation in terms of accidental processes. The contrary view, that life can be plausibly attributed to accidental processes, even though divine intent may have actually been present, I will call the non-confrontational view. Examples of the non-confrontational view before defending the confrontational view, I want to further demonstrate the opposing view by bringing in uh, other respected voices. And most of you have heard this many times before, so I'm just going to give the examples that he gives. Francis Collins, Robert Bishop, um, William Lane Craig. Um, this emphasis on science having no valid way to prove God had no role in creation is a hallmark of the non-confrontational view. It leaves a science safe for atheism. Again, the idea seems to be that this assurance should be adequate compensation for those who are being asked to surrender the time-honored idea that life stubbornly refuses to be explained by ordinary physical causes. Surely, however, we ought to give this tried and true idea due, due consideration before we th even think of abandoning it. What accidental causes cannot do. To help us do that, let's take a moment to examine three sequences of letters. And most of you have seen these kinds of sequences before. Sequence one, sequence two, sequence three. 
As you look at them, one of them is obviously unequivocally designed. Those, this won't be obvious to you. Two of these sequences were purposefully constructed. The one exception was constructed from atmospheric noise of all things. More specifically, background noise at a radio frequency not used for broadcasting has been used for many years to produce true random numbers. Probably not true, but what, close to it. Um, by random.org. So the atmosphere was the author of one of the above sequences. The obvious fact, I however, is that one of the three sequences is a meaningful sequence, whereas the other two are not. Sequence three is well worth pondering, particularly in the context of the writing from which it came, while the other two sequences are unintelligible junk. I assure you that I did labor over one of those th first two sequences, purposefully arranging the characters to construct a sequence that looks very much like the unintelligible junk that comes from atmospheric noise. Speaking of the sequence I constructed in this way, then I can say something very similar to what Francis Collins said about life. The making of that sequence appears to have been driven by chance, but from my perspective, the outcome was entirely specified. But neither Collins nor any of the others I've quoted meant to imply that life looks like unintelligible junk. Everybody knows better than that. Berkeley psychologist Alison Gopnik, writing in the Wall Street Journal, affirmed that by elementary school age, children start to invoke an ultimate godlike designer to explain the complexity of the world around them. Even children brought up as atheists. With work, atheists learn to suppress this intuition but the people I've quoted, all of them believers, certainly haven't done that. Well, actually, they have in a certain sense. They have, however, caused confusion by blending a harmful falsehood with an uncontentious fact. I'm not suggesting this blending has been deliberate, only that it has happened and continues to happen. To be clear, here are the two claims that should not be confused. Claim one, intelligent be beings can imitate the effect of accidental causes. Claim two, accidental causes can imitate the work of intelligent beings. As thoroughly uninteresting as claim one is, it at least has the advantage of being true. Claim two, on the other hand, has very much the opposite character, beguilingly intriguing, but false. When these contrasting claims are combined indiscriminately, the result is a confusing and potentially harmful distortion of the truth. To clear up the confusion, the possibility of intelligent beings imitating accidental causes needs to be set aside as a mere distraction. The interesting fact is that intelligence opens the door to a rich world of activities that simply don't exist apart from intelligence. I refer to a broad category of these activities as invention, by which I mean any undertaking where many small things have to be arranged in a precisely coordinated way in order to re achieve a big result. Certainly our modern technologies, uh, technological mar uh, marvels, all come out about by invention, but so do the more ordinary projects we all tackle on a daily basis. Everything from the composing of an email to the organizing of a workspace or the design of a custom fitness plan. We are all inventors. All inventions, whether common or technical, share the characteristic hierarchical structure shown in figure 1.1. Consider my writing of this chapter, for example, and he goes on to elaborate a little further, but here's figure 1.1. You have a functional whole. It's divided into two, maybe three, in this particular case in the chapter is three, main components, and then subcomponents, which would be paragraphs that support those, and then elementary constituents. Well, actually, there's about four or five layers before you get to the elementary con constituents, because uh, then you have uh, sent, uh, sentences, and then you have uh, words, and, and finally you have uh, individual letters. And of course, the hierarchy goes all the way down from the sentence level to the elementary constituents of written communication, the letters of the alphabet. We conceive of writing projects in a top-down way, but we accomplish them in a bottom-up way. Arranging letters to spell words in order to form sentences, in order to build paragraphs, in order to achieve our main writing objective. 
This hierarchical organization is a hallmark of invention, present in everything from three-course dinners to communication satellites. I refer to it as functional coherence, the coordinated combination of functions over a succession of levels to achieve a single top-level function. Intuitively, we all know that nothing but intelligent action can construct things in this way. And then he gives an example of his cat and uh, stepping onto a computer. Now, if I had to argue that it's possible for a cat's footsteps to compose a sensible paragraph, I know how I'd go about it. i break the impossible big outcome, a sensible paragraph, into something much smaller. Paragraphs are written one keystroke at a time, so that would be the obtainable goal. If you had typed N-O-V-E-M-B-E, -E, for example, no one would think it impossible for your cat to just happen to step on the R key, thereby completing the word November. And then, you know, you do this multiple times, uh, by, you get the idea, by continuing this succession of unlikely but possible steps, we seem to be forced to conclude that, strictly speaking, it isn't impossible for a cat to have written this chapter for me. And yet, we all know that, practically speaking, it is impossible. These seemingly contradictory assessments are easily reconciled by distinguishing impossibility in the mathematical sense of P equals zero, from impossibility in the practical sense of don't bother waiting for this to happen because it isn't going to happen. Darwin's explanation of life fails in that practical sense, which is its undoing. For accidental causes to have invented life is impossible in the same way that a cat writing an essay is impossible. We can be fully confident that neither has ever happened nor will ever happen. <coughs> Now you may be wondering whether we really can with equal confidence reject both the accidental origin of felines and the feline origin of essays. A cat on a keyboard gets no help from natural selection, which is thought to be the driving force for evolution. Is this really a fair comparison then? My answer is that, as utterly impossible as it is for a cat to write something we recognize as an essay, it is far less probable for accidental processes to have invented the living things that populate our planet. My defense of this answer will have to be very brief here. Those interested in a more full discussion should read Undeniable, which we've reviewed in this class. The first thing to recognize is that for accidental causes to accomplish something that would normally require insight is a coincidence. It's for a good reason that we don't expect anything other than insight to do the work of insight. Insight is so unique among causes, categorically different from every physical cause, that no other cause should do the work of insight. This is why we notice those rare occasions when even the slightest hint of insight occurs by accident. You bump into an old classmate at a small restaurant thousands of miles from where you both live. Your cat types OK before hopping over your keyboard. A locksmith appears as if on cue a moment after you realize you needed one. Coincidences like these are surprising enough to get our attention, but plausible enough to happen from time to time. By contrast, we can easily imagine much bigger coincidences that we know will never happen by accident. Picture all your old classmates just happening to converge on that faraway restaurant as though a class reunion had been planned there. Or your cat before hopping over the keyboard typing, I like canned food much better than dry food, so let's make the change, okay? <laughs> Imagine that locksmith who happens to appear at just the right time also happening to be holding in his hand a key that happens to match the one you lost. The fact that we rank coincidences intuitively in this way, according to how unbelievable they are, turns out to have a solid rational basis. Probability is, in essence, the math of coincidence, the math by which we rigorously rank coincidences. We use probabilities to gauge how often certain outcomes should occur when the only apparent reason for them to occur is that nothing absolutely pre precludes them from occurring. The underlying idea is that whatever can happen will happen if the number of opportunities for it to happen is large enough. Whether or not we know how to calculate probabilities, we all seem to know from everyday experience, common science, 
that the number of opportunities cannot be large enough for anything but minor coincidences to occur. We can easily dream up wild coincidences that are obviously unbelievable, the stuff of fantasy. The believable ones are always much more tame. This common science intuition turns out to be absolutely correct. And once we see how it connects to figure 1.1, we, we will see how it connects to the general theme of invention. The reason inventions never happen by accident is that wild coincidences of that kind simply can't happen. Whether we're talking about making a pizza or a PowerPoint presentation, a large number of small things must be done sensibly in order for the big thing to come together. These small things are carefully arranged, are the carefully arranged elementary constituents represented in the bottom row of figure 1.1. Projects like this are easily are easy for us to accomplish because we've mastered all the elementary skills they require but the fact that these skills all had to be mastered assures us that accidents will never take the place of skill with so many ways for accidental causes to do the wrong things at each little step typing yet another incoherent letter or spilling yet another ingredient on the floor the outcome of accidental causes is guaranteed to be a mess no escaping the truth. The two popular reasons for thinking that evolution escapes the rule that accidental invention is impossible are natural selection and the vastness of evolutionary time. However, neither of these proposed reasons stands up to technical scrutiny. I'll say more about this in a moment. The point I'm much more eager to convince people of is that no technical scrutiny is actually needed to close off these escapes. To be confident that a claimed coincidence is implausible, all we have to do is see that the magnitude of this would-be coincidence places it firmly in the category of the unbelievable. If that's the case, then it really is unbelievable. As long as proponents of evolution continue to claim that genius wasn't needed for Earth to become populated with these remarkable living things we see around us, they set themselves up for refutation. We don't have to become technical experts in genetics or natural selection or anything else to know their claim is wrong. All we need to know is that for unintelligent causes to have imitated genius on such a vast scale would require a very large convergence of impossible coincidences, which is, of course, utterly impossible. Life in all its forms is obviously the work of genius, and clueless causes are as far removed from genius as the East is from the West, complete opposites. So for these causes to just happen to behave like genius would be an unbelievable coincidence, literally unbelievable. There's a strict limit to what can be excused as coincidence and things like fireflies and hummingbirds and humans are way beyond that limit. Natural selection being just one more clueless cause among many is powerless to change this. For natural selection acting on genetic mistakes to have transformed primitive bacteria into hummingbirds would require clueless causes which know not absolutely nothing about hummingbirds to just happen to do a work of pure genius. Again, our intuition tells us there cannot have been enough opportunities in the history of life for the improbability of, of such a thoroughly unbelievable coincidence to have been overcome. As we'll see in a moment, this intuition is absolutely correct. So we don't have to l give natural selection another thought in order to know that it cannot possibly rescue evolutionary theory from its fundamental failing. Still, a closer look at selection can have the gratifying effect of reinforcing what we already know. When we take this closer look, we see that the specific problem with selection, aside from the general problem of being clueless, is that it shows up only after the hard work of invention has been done. Richard Dawkins inadvertently pointed to this while acknowledging the impossible difficulty of that hard work in The Blind Watchmaker, no less. However many ways, as quoting Richard Dawkins, there may be of being alive, it is certain that there are vastly more ways of being dead, or rather, not alive. You may throw cells together at random over and over again for a billion years, and not once will you get a conglomeration that flies or swims or burrows or runs, or does anything, even badly, that could be remotely be construed as working to keep itself alive. That's Richard Dawkins. Dawkins seems to have thought that the key to surmounting the extreme improbability he describes here lay in these words at random. 
It's true, of course, that natural selection favors certain variations over others in a non-random way. The more significant point, however, is that, the sele that selection can do this only after those variations work to keep their possessors alive. You have to get the fittest before you can select the fittest. Something other than selection must therefore be responsible for coming up with these highly special arrangements that work. Credit for the invention of living things with all their marvelous features then rightfully goes not to natural selection, but to the one who invented them, God. The second popular reason for thinking Darwin's theory is exempt from the common sense rule that invention never happens by accident is the vast time over which evolution is said to have occurred. It's true, of course, that longer times provide more opportunities for coincidences to occur. Equally true is that most people are uncomfortable with the math that assigns probabilities to coincidences. Thankfully, our intuition fills in very nicely for any aversion to these probabilistic calculations. People may struggle to put a number on the improbability of a cat writing a sensible paragraph, but everyone knows right away it can't happen. Practically speaking, we sense that the probability is indistinguishable from zero. We can well imagine using the internet to organize a let your cat walk on your keyboard day with a million participants. Stranger things have happened. And we're co very comfortable saying that nothing resembling coherent writing would come out of the event. Pushing feasibility to the extreme then, we might then try to imagine all habitable planets in the universe being populated to the greatest possible extent with cats and covered to the greatest possible extent with keyboards that register every press of a key. Unbelievable coincidences are unbelievable for a very good reason. Again, our confidence in this point is fully justified by our common science experience. We don't have to do any technical science at all to know that accidental causes cannot do the work of genius. Nevertheless, it should be satisfying to know that a good many people spending a good many years laboring over the technical science, including the author of this uh, chapter, um, have indeed proven that it confirms what we all know by common science. As I mentioned previously, my contribution to that work has been in the area, t area of protein science. You'll encounter some of this work in more detail in the next chapter where Stephen Meyer describes the extreme improbabilities of accidental causes inventing new functional proteins of gaps and wars, having argued that attempting to accommodate Darwin's theory within the framework of traditional faith is not only costly, but also misguided, I'd like to off uh, consider briefly some reasons being offered to justify the accommodation. The two reasons that appear to be most common I'll refer to as the God of the Gaps comment, complaint, and the unwinnable war plea. Dennis Alexander traces the origin of God of the Gaps complaint to back to the mid-18th century when, with the rapid advance of natural sciences, it was realized that a God who is simply a convenient explanation to cope with gaps in our scientific knowledge would not last for very long. It's hard to disagree with this as a general principle. When an unexpected noise is heard from the next room you, and you go to check it out, you do well to assume an ordinary explanation, breeze through a window left open or squirrels on the roof. It would be comically unwise for anyone to declare to their kids upon hearing the sound, that's probably the second coming, run into the next room and I think you'll see Jesus. The thing is I've not actually, I haven't actually come across anyone who thinks that way. Even if we never figure out what made that noise, we instinctively assume the cause was ordinary. For the most part, people appear, appeal to supernatural explanations only when they become convinced that there cannot be a natural explanation. In this way, we acknowledge the real possibility of being confronted by God's activity over and above his role as sustainer of the created order. Moreover, God himself seems to endorse this perspective by using miracles both to reveal his specific will and to demonstrate his authority over his created order. The God of the Gaps complaint is heavily overused. Nearly every time a person of sincere faith attributes something to God's supernatural activity, they are saying, in effect, I don't believe this can have a natural explanation. Never in my experience are they merely saying, here's something the scientists haven't uh, yet explained. 
Of course, people are often wrong in making the supernatural uh, attribution, but the reason for the error is nearly always a desire for God to grant a personal re revelation in an extraordinary way, not a desire to gloat over the limits of scientific knowledge. Those who automatically resort to the God of the gaps complaint every time God is said to have acted upon na nature in a way that is clearly apart from and above the normal course of nature inevitably find themselves criticizing God himself. As for the unwinnable war plea, this I have also encountered numerous times. In a Reasonable Faith co podcast, William Lane Craig made the plea as follows. As Christians, you don't have to make a frontal assault on one of the pillars of contemporary science in the name of Christianity. That, in the minds of most people, will simply disqualify Christianity rather than evolutionary biology. If they hear that evolutionary biology is incompatible with theism, well, guess which belief is going to be given up? It's going to be theism, because the evolutionary paradigm is so entrenched that theism, if it's incompatible with it, will simply be disqualified as incredible. Here again, whether I agree with this depends on how I construe it. If a friend holds tenaciously to belief X, fill in the blank, and most uh, central tenets of the faith can be shared with this friend without engaging in a battle over X, then by all means focus the discussion on those central tenets. As a Christian, I certainly think Christians should be able to share the gospel without starting an argument over any of these, three, uh, any of these X's, including Darwinism. Should the friend become a Christian, then evolution may well be one of the many areas where their new faith casts new light on old ways of thinking. But even if you intend to approach the discussion in this way, don't be just surprised if your friend has other ideas. You may well find that he or she wants to use Darwinism as reason for de rejecting your faith. What should you do then? If you adopt a policy of surrendering everything but the bare essentials, you may well find yourself surrendering a whole lot. Everything that challenges the pillars of contemporary science, the pillars of contemporary morality, the pillars of contemporary culture, and so on. What do you suppose your friend will make of a faith that surrenders so much? Jesus called his followers to surrender their lives, their pride, their earthly security, and at times their positions, right down to the shirts on their backs. He never, however, called them to surrender the truth. That they are charged with guarding even if it costs them their lives. Sometimes the pillars are exactly the things that need to come down if the truth is to be heard and received. Context and conclusion. We humans pride ourselves in our rational faculties, but the truth is that we aren't as rational as we pretend to be. Many of us like to think our heads are in control, which is more or less true on matters where our hearts are indifferent. Whenever our hearts aren't passive, though, the situation changes. If we aren't careful, our heads can end up slavishly serving our heart's desires. Reasoning can turn into rationalizing in a heartbeat. The most candid atheists have admitted that atheism comes down to a heart thing, not a head thing. Philosopher of mind Thomas Nagel, for example, frankly acknowledges his fear of religion as a condition he refers to as the cosmic authority problem. His rational faculties are second to none, but when it comes to God, he doesn't pretend to be dispassionate. I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. According to Nagel, accordingly, Nagel has applied his mind to the task of making sense of his heart's desire, and he clearly sees the utility of Darwinism for this purpose. By providing a godless creation story, Darwin enabled modern secular culture to heave a great collective sigh of relief, he says. Other atheists seem to content with that secular story, but Nagel is different. Richard Dawkins has devoted himself to promoting the story, believing that Dawkins, as he put it, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Nagel, on the other hand, refuses to go along with what he sees as an inadequate picture of reality, however convenient it may look to atheists. As the subtitle of his recent book says, he has set out to show why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. In the end, what gets passed off by intellectuals as a pillar is really a crutch, a way for atheists to pretend to have explained what is absolutely inexplicable apart from God. As theists, we have the one true explanation for the world we inhabit, an explanation that's not just plausible, but uniquely plausible. 
It is the explanation. Why would we choose to deprive people of this? The truth that seems to embarrass some of us is the very truth we need to proclaim. Now, my take on all this, I think Doug Axe has written a very powerful chapter. Evolution is wrong. People really intuitively know this. People are often too impressed with supposed but not real experts, <laughs> or perhaps better experts peeking outside their field of expertise. Trust your gut. <coughs> it is supported by good research. The cost of desperately hoping for wiggle room instead of confidently realizing that the data is on your side is precisely the loss of confidence, as well as wonder at God rather than wonder about God. Natural selection cannot create, period. Mutations or variations have to do all the work of creation and everyone knows they really can't. The real problem is that theistic evolutions are afraid that A, they might say something that is later found to be wrong and B, no one will believe them. They have not had the experience of finding that theism can make predictions that can, and in some cases have been, corroborated. They never saw it work, so they don't believe it can. I understand not challenging the beliefs of others openly, immediately, but eventually some beliefs will have to be challenged or one cannot say anything. Perhaps a return to empirical science challenging the current scientific consensus is the best approach. At least that's the one I have found most promising. When people see a theistic approach to science work, that approach becomes much more believable at that point. Now, the God of the gaps argument deserves another look. Taken to its logical conclusion, if the God of the gaps argument can never be used, there can be no evidence for a personal God. Period. God is reduced to the ground of all being, devoid of any interaction with his creation. You are reduced to basically a deist God. If that, the God of the gaps argument is really a demand that theists surrender any claim to be empirically right. Because you just wait, we're going to turn out to be right, you're going to be turn out to be wrong, so why don't you quit before we even get started? Finally, scientific experts are sorely tempted to speak as if authoritative outside their field of expertise. Otherwise, nobody would listen to them. However, it is still a wrong thing to do. You are as good as the other relevant non-experts, and you can make yourself better than them with a little study. At least, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Uh, regarding the guard of the gaps, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a powerful argument to a certain extent, historically. Uh, Newton started it, even though he was, certainly didn't intend it. Uh, where he showed, you know, many things that were attributed to God or uh, followed certain laws and so on, and uh, they began to lose their magical uh, value. Um, and should be said, should be said, well, well um, yeah, but only God can create organic molecules, and I believe it was Wother uh, created urea and destroyed that one. Yes. And uh, we've had to back down on a whole number of assumptions here, uh, which uh, has kind of uh, carried uh, uh, some weight. Uh, but I would uh, argue that we, we need to probably uh, redefine or at least uh, amplify the explanation of God of the gaps into there are those gaps uh, in a terminology that's used at the time is God of 
there's a God of the gaps and there's a God of the necessary gaps. Uh, which I to, think that's what he was trying to do when he made his distinction there. Yeah, I, I think he, I think he was headed in that direction, and and I, I think that uh, is a point that needs to be emphasized. That uh, while uh, a lot of religious beliefs have had to uh, capitulate, I think. I should say religious belief, religious speculation, I'd say, perhaps, capitulate to uh, science. Along the way, uh, at the same time, the science has said just the opposite, that there are necessary gaps out there, like the original life, you know, and the Cambrian explosion and uh, the... Uh, Which, interestingly enough, um, with further study, are getting worse rather than better. Yeah. Uh, residual carbon 14 paraconformities and uh, mm -hmm. so on. These are uh, what I'd say uh, more in the area of the necessary gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, I think a little insightful uh, designation here would, would help uh, in this particular particular argument. I, uh, just another comment about uh, Collins' position, you know. You, you, that's not something we can touch. Uh, idea of God and so on, that science can't touch that per thing. I think God can point, uh, science can point to, to uh, things outside of its realm. But, but it, it has its limits. On yeah. That. And uh, it leads to a dualism that I think is totally unacceptable rationally. If you want truth, you don't go to dualism. Uh, is there truth that you can't test and truth that you can't test? There's only one truth. Well, I there may be truth that. that you can't test and truth that you can, yes. Yeah. There may very well be. Um, but it's all some truth. Some tests are impractical. But it's all truth. It's all truth. That's unifying. Go ahead. The word theism or theistic is central to your presentation. Perhaps this was discussed in an earlier one, in your earlier presentation last week, which I missed. But um, the, as I understand it, and I don't pretend to be really deeply, profoundly understanding of these things. But the concept of theism as defined or worked with frequently in, <clears throat> in the 18th century, and it was very popular back then to talk about theism versus deism, could be th differentiated, but uh, in this presentation, you seem to be using the word theism in a much more generic way than in the 18th century philosophical discussion. We often hear that our founding fathers, some of them were theists and others were deists, and they made a very um, crucial distinction of, 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 such, uh, of the difference between theism and deism. Perhaps you could re uh, reassure us that this, you're using this term theistic much more generically perhaps to apply merely to a uh, person who believes in God without otherwise uh, distinguishing how he believes in God. Well, I think that, uh, that you would have to say that the, the concept of theism is not only that a person believes in a God, but you believe in a God who can act in the what, for want of a better term, is the natural world. Um, which means that things will happen with this God that would not have happened if nature had been allowed to uh, what's sometimes called take its course. Um, and that, I think, is the uh, probably the best definition of theism. With that definition, Christians in general and Adventists in particular, I think, 
well, most of us anyway, are uh, theists. So, yeah, I'm talking about a fairly wide definition. Uh, a deist is a god, would be a god who set it up and either continues to sustain it but never breaks his own rules, so to speak, or else who uh, set it up and set the rules up so that they can run on their own. And the difference between those two is not, certainly not easily empirically testable. So it doesn't really make too much difference which one of those you, you, you pick. Uh, a theist god could part the Red Sea. A deist god would have to set it up so that at a certain point there would be a wind or whatever that would allow the Red Sea to part, or else, more likely, would say the Red Sea didn't really part, that was just a bunch of folklore. I think that's a very good explanation, <laughs> as good as I've heard. <clears throat> I must confess that before I came here and uh, actually heard your presentation, I had figured that it was going to be more closely uh, applied to, say, the kind of creationism that, uh, as I understand, taught at La Sierra, or at least is promoted over there, in which uh, they try to compromise evolution with a religion. Well, and uh, take a theistic evolution, in which case you could use the term theistic creation as appropriately as creation, theistic evolution at six of one and half a dozen of another. Again, there, there, there are at least four flavors. There's a standard, uh, there's the standard uh, young life creationism. There's an old life creationism where God took specific points, boom, 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 and decided to create. And therefore, the Cambrian explosion was a true explosion that was caused by a god who actually planted trilobites and whatever else in there, uh, hallucinogenia. Uh, so that was God just, and so it comes, boom, and it looks like a miracle because it is. Then there are people who would say, well, God didn't actually do that. What he did was he monkeyed with the, um, uh, the DNA in such a way that a creature which was a originally, let's say, a sponge, laid uh, whatever sponge eggs there are, created sponge embryos, but instead of those embryos having sponge DNA, they had magically transformed mm -hmm into, or perhaps transformed over five steps or something like that, which are now lost to history, um, into um, uh, trilobite eggs, let's say. Uh, and, and that's why you don't have the history. It is truly a miracle, but it wasn't a macroscopic miracle of the kind where God just planted organisms. Um, but it's detectable that that couldn't have happened by chance alone because it's outside the reasonable probabilities or even the kind of quasi maybe reasonable po probabilities that one could expect. Um, so that is, uh, that is an intelligent design theistic evolution. Theistic evolution used to encompass both kinds. And so what this is taking aim at is not so much any one of those three options. It's rather the fourth option that you really can't tell that God did the work, for sure. And maybe you kind of lean towards it because you're a believer in God, but you know, an atheist could believe that it just happened by chance. And what, and what Acts is saying is no, that doesn't work. Because the fact of the matter is the atheists are wrong on this. And therefore all the people who are leaning on atheist theory and trying to incorporate it into Christianity are wrong because 
the, the underlying theory is wrong. And we really all know that. And what's been happening is that people who claim to be experts are coming up to us and saying, but I happen to know about real estate in New York. And I happen to know a source that has the deed to the Brooklyn Bridge and you can have it for $50,000. That's what's happening. And you need to, I mean, if you're smart and you're, uh, you can become an expert and find out that no, they really don't know what they're talking about and they're really just after your money. Or you can, you can just trust your gut and say, no, this doesn't smell right and not buy it anyway. I may not have understood clearly uh, what uh, the uh, individual you were uh, evaluating was really saying. It seemed to me that this individual was extremely uncomfortable with the kinds of things that seem to really be happening in microevolution, that is, that is random genetic change with the degree of selection. He seems to want, to me, he's saying, nah, not even that, God did each one of these. Which is kind of a very, a very difficult position. It seems like he, if I'm understanding it right, he did that because he doesn't want to deal with that these kinds of what we call microevolution could not explain macroevolution, he doesn't want to have to deal with that, or am I wrong? I, I think you're hearing him incorrectly, just from the sense that I got. Um, he is very much, very friendly with, uh, we, we've been over his book, uh, Undeniable, and I think that that goes, gives you some very good clues as to where he's coming I, from. I wasn't here at that time. Yeah, I, I, and, and if, yeah, if you want to read and understand where he's coming from, that book probably will give you the best shot at understanding. But uh, he is very comfortable with microevolution. Microevolution is your cat stepping on the key O and the key K uh, accidentally somewhere along the line. Macroevolution is your, key, key, uh, your cat Stepping on, I really don't like. Um, uh, okay, that, that's a that's a that's a fair synthesis of what you said. It's just some of the things, the way they were said, is kind of like well, variation, genetic variation, and selection can't do anything outside of God's yeah. decision. And of course, the next thing I was wondering, well, men have have done quite a bit through selective breeding. And and the, and the and the raw material is the same. Um, and you can argue that artificial selection is more efficient for what you want than natural selection because natural selection has no overriding purpose. Saying I eventually want the pigeon's crop to be as big as a pigeon. Uh, uh, y you know, that won't happen naturally. Because the, the, only, the only selective ability natural selection has is, can it make more pigeons? Um, and having a crop as big as a pigeon is not, not something you would aim at. But, but the point of it is that you don't turn a pigeon into a, a turkey. And yeah, they're passenger pigeons. They probably have the same general DNA as regular pigeons did. Um, and they probably came about by some kind of a natural selection plus random variations. And I, I think he would be comfortable with that. What he's not comfortable uh, is as getting pigeons from lizards. And I would have to agree with him on that. This is my first exposure and from what I was hearing this morning, and this is not meant to be critical at all. Yeah. It sounded like he was just not willing to deal with any of these basic processes that seem to be happening. No, I, I think he's, I, th I mean, having read some of mm -hmm. what he has to say and, and I think understanding the culture he's uh, living in, uh, that 
that he would be comfortable saying that, that microevolution is good. It's just you cannot extrapolate it beyond a certain point without the math going haywire. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you should say to yourself, no, this took a little extra design. And they're not willing to, they're not willing to take on the issue of, did God plant stuff yet? Although obviously in the case of life, you pretty much had to. And they're certainly not willing to take a, a, on the question of time. And that's why the book is written the way it is, is, you know, they start out with the introduction saying, we take no issue on either of those. Although it's fascinating because the theological people seem to argue for something that really makes old age, old earth creationism uh, difficult and makes uh, God-guided evolution uh, difficult as well. But we'll get to that when we get there. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, two quick questions. Number one, um, what is the difference between microevolution and adaptation? When um, Darwin went to Galapagos Islands, he saw certain kind of finches, he said, this is evolution. Well, it's adaptation. So what is really microevolution? Uh, well, if you want to get a really careful definition, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, that, uh, and the reason I say that is because there are several different definitions and one of them is relatively easy and one of them is uh, much more difficult. Uh, Microevolution is in one sense is simply a change in an organism. The polar, the, I mean, the bears over here are brown, the bears over here are dark, are black. Why? There's three bears. And which one came first? It's really hard to say. And, but, but they can all breed with each other, so presumably they were all one kind originally. Okay. Um, and, and that one could be simply a sorting of various genomes from an originally heterogeneous uh, a set of bears. And, you know, the black ones survive better in some environments and the brown ones survive better in some environments. And some environments e favor e them equally, but, uh, but there were bottlenecks and random chance dicta uh, dictated which color survived. Um, however, there is a naturally selected set of bears, and they're white. And they live in snow-covered co areas or uh, where the general uh, everything is white. They have advantages. There's a reason why they got there. They're probably not the original bears. And they're effectively partial albinos is what they are. Not full albinos because they still have black on their noses and stuff like that, but partial albinos in that their, their hair is turned white. Um, and that's, that's an adaptation. On the other hand, it's a loss of information. So that uh, they have lost the ability to put pigment into their hair either because the pigment gene itself was damaged or by because some gene that, that made sure that it got into hair follicles was damaged. And I don't know the answer to which one of those. Um, uh, of interest, I am told also that they have black skin. Um, but uh, the question is, can you go the reverse can you have where you create a whole new enzyme so that you can now do things that you couldn't do before? And the answer appears to be probably not. Um, two chapters from now, we're gonna go over some of that. And it's gonna be fascinating to look at the, the math that's required to get there. 
and all the intuitions that we have that you know you really can't do this are going to turn out to be correct. Well, um, then perhaps we did go back to thousand years, several thousand years, and the good book says after its own kind. So it's talking about the genus, genus, not the species. Then uh, um, probably more like the family in most cases. Sure. Yeah. Um, they talk about, for example, uh, Caucasians who have lived in the uh, Nordic areas for years and they've been drinking milk. Uh, very high percentage of them are not lactose intolerant. Correct. Go to Thailand and g give them milk, they're in deep trouble. Yeah. So no, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, Richard Dawkins, great book. And the, mm, the blind watchman that you, uh, watchmaker that you just quoted, he says, take a bunch of cells and they will never become an organism, no matter how many years, if I hardly you know, tried. Such an intelligent man, why didn't, or, or, where do you get the cells from? Well, uh, and so why doesn't he say nothing comes from nothing? Well, Richard Dawkins will at that point say, um, the people over there who do research on the origin of life have those answers. I just deal with biology. <laughs> and uh, he will listen to the ones that agree with what he wants to say and not listen to the ones that disagree with what he wants to say. Uh, probably the most important one of which is Eugene Koonin, who uh, pointed out that the chances of getting uh, getting DNA-based, protein-based life uh, are somewhere w well less than two to uh, 10 to the 1,018, which means that it won't happen in anywhere in our universe. So the only way that it could happen is if you had multiple universes, and he actually presents that as a hypothesis because he said you run out of you run out of lottery tickets otherwise. To me, for him being such an intelligent man to make a statement and not to be able to substantiate it is kind of naive. You have to keep in mind that these are partly, they're partly scientists and they're partly evangelists. And they play fast and loose with the truth every bit as much and maybe more than um, some of our uh, religious evangelists. And we have a comment over here. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciated uh, your reasoning and your presentation very much. Uh, well, some of it is Doug Axe's reasoning, so I can't claim pre credit for that part. But, uh, I see the hummingbird up there, and uh, well, you know, everyone here knows one of the most famous critics of the design argument was David Hume, and um, he was, the basic concept, of course, is that all artificial machines uh, require genius and a designer if it's artificial. Um, but if we compare the hummingbird there on the screen with the helicopter, the helicopter is an artificial um, machine. So the helicopter requires genius. But its natural counterpart, counterpart um, what about it? Do we, do we attribute genius to the origin of the hummingbird? So David Hume um, said, well, uh, at first he said, not really. What we do is we, we appeal to generation for the design of the hummingbird. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting, to generation. Well, when you state the argument that way, it's pretty obvious that a hummingbird totally outclasses a helicopter. <laughs> yes. Amen. I, I mean, in terms of, of the requirements. Yes. And it doesn't take more than about a seven-year-old to figure out that, you know, 
that must have been made by somebody. And then some schools try to pound that out of you. Try to say, no, it really could happen if you gradually improved the hummingbird. Without anybody realizing that until you, until you get down to understanding how the hummingbird is made, you're doing hand waving. You literally don't have a clue as to what you're talking about. So what we know now about hummingbirds is that inside each hummingbird cell there is this long string which, I don't know, if you unravel it probably is you know, two or three meters long or something like that. Uh, maybe one. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice long string of DNA that is microscopically coded for all the proteins on a hummingbird. Not just all the proteins straight through, but in some cases where you need proteins that are a little bit different, it's coded with multiple uh, ways so that you can take the same DNA and make, you know, 25 proteins. And in fact, in the case of the ear, the same probably 30, 30 codes will give you 300 proteins. Each one a little different because each one is, is, uh, is spliced and uh, together a little different. The, the, the complexity of the code is just simply amazing. And what is tried to be said is, well, we started out by saying, well, you know, you make the wings a little longer, you make the, you know, muscles a little faster, you, you change things from a macroscopic point of view and gradually you can form a lizard into a hummingbird. Well, actually a dinosaur, I think, but whatever, you know. The idea is that there are gradual morphologic gradients. Well, each one of those morphologic gradients has to, has to have a DNA that makes it work in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, the math really won't work. Uh, now, I'm saying that, and I'm expecting you to believe it, but uh, I'm gonna say that there are people who have done the math and can show that it doesn't work. Um, and so what it boils down to is the people who were telling you that the morphologic change could happen had good imaginations but didn't have good understanding of how the hummingbird works or good math abilities, either one. In fact, evolutionary biologists are famous for not doing very well at math. Well, it's very interesting because, to be fair to Hume, he's, he finally said, well, I think we need to appeal to some internal ordering principle. And I think you're describing that very beautifully. Uh, and then he said, well, the theist, we can't explain, he can't explain where his God comes from. I can't explain where my ordering principle comes from, so we just leave it at that. Well, uh, one can argue that the ordering principle is in fact precisely God. And so, what both of uh, them are really confessing is they don't really understand God well. Hmm. Well, in that case, then we, we ought to be really careful about saying, well, I know what God can't do, or what God won't do. The fact of the matter is we don't know that either. And, see, I view the Bible not so much as a revelation from God, although it is that in a sense, it's data. These people saw what they saw and they wrote it down. Some of what they saw is unbelievable if you don't believe there's a God. Well, you can, you can say in that case they don't have authority. The other tack to take is to say, well, maybe there had to be a God. And if you find that science points towards God and these people point towards God, then maybe you better take them more seriously. They're giving you data. You know what happens in science when you throw away data? It's the second worst sin you can do. 
only behind making it up yourself. Okay? And so, to me, it's all part of the same thing. You were talking about uh, that, you know, truth in science and truth outside of science. Well, the fact of the matter is that truth is what we're, what we're after. Yeah, uh, j just a uh, comment. It seems to me that Acts is uh, endorsing Christianity to a certain extent uh, in referring to the Bible and uh, so on. And uh, I'm interested in this in the context of uh, theistic evolution as various definitions. Um, and uh, apparently they're not going to wrestle with the time issue. Not going to wrestle with the, uh, and I think this is where theistic evolution, using that term broadly, uh, has its greatest weakness in that it doesn't have a, a broadly accepted authority for the model. Uh, science, mechanicalities of uh, empirical science doesn't say that God did it that way because they don't consider God in the picture. And those, certainly this is not the model that the Bible has. It's uh, uh, so that uh, they're kind of hanging there to a certain extent without a, a good source of information to back them up. Well, I think what, he's got, what he is saying is something that is profound and important, and that is that, yes, God did it and you can tell. And that means that of those five broad categories that we talked about, two of them are gone. The category of atheistic evolution is gone. And the category that God did it, but you really can't tell, is gone. Because you really can't tell. Now, once you get that far, Knowing what happened in history is far more dependent on what God would do than what nature can do without God. And that means that you're going to... Uh, I, I was really pleased that they did the book and they gave a theological critique afterwards because you're going to find yourself fascinated when we get to the theological critique it's going to point towards a short age creationism. I don't think they wanted to. That's the biblical model. But that's where, that's the, 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 the theology, and, and, and uh, yeah. John, some of the themes that you have, have mentioned in the past will come out. The problem mm -hmm. of the atonement. The, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and, and they're frank in saying, look, if you go this way, you can't have the atonement. Well, you know what? If you go this way and you have uh, a, th a gradual evolutionary model, you also don't have an atonement, really. When you say, I, I, I believe in God, but I reject the Bible model, uh, you're in not as strong a position as uh, most of society is. Uh, well, I shouldn't say the Western society is. Well, I think they're smart, in one sense, to have started out by saying we're not going to answer this question. Because they come out winding up kind of in a backwards way answering it anyway, and leaving people who want to use a longer age model struggling to figure out how that model uh, is compatible with Christianity. And I think that's a question they need to wrestle with. Um, there are various ways of persuasion. And, uh, but I think one of their ways is to try to, try to make it to where uh, they start out with stuff that you can understand and you can agree with, and then pointing out more and more implications of it, and then uh, rather than 
pulling it up and now what are you going to do? You need to be converted tonight. Just leaving you hanging it, hanging with it. And in fact, there's an argument to be made that if you're dealing with people who are overly impressed with what bills itself as science and what I would rather call this current scientific consensus, um, that, that some of the best ways of dealing with that are simply to ask, well, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? And leave them hanging because it will eat into their thinking and they'll go, you know, that really wasn't a good answer. You know, that wasn't a good answer either. And pretty soon they're flipping. And I have two major uh, biochemists in mind who flipped uh, that precise way. People, uh, uh, people coming up to them and asking them, well, you know, how do you explain this? And how do you explain that? And just to, the kinds of questions people would normally ask, but, and having the professor say, you know, uh, well, here's the, here's the standard answer, and then thinking to themselves, but that wasn't a good answer. And finally winding up having their whole system collapse on them because they couldn't honestly uh, keep, keep it going. Anyway, uh, next week, barring uh, unforeseen circumstances, we will be talking about uh, uh, Stephen Meyer's uh, article on, uh, on the impossibility of evolution as well.